Hi everyone, in this video we're going to be looking at one of the most famous and important theorems in mathematics, Bolzano's theorem. We're going to give a constructive proof of it and also show a way of numerically solving equations that's known as the bisection method. Let's discover the maths. We're going to start with playing a game that involves guessing a number that's between 1 and 50. You think of a number and I'll guess numbers one after another until I find the right answer. I could start with 50 and work my way down, 49, 48 and so on, but clearly that's not going to be a very good strategy. I might get lucky doing it this way if the number you happen to have chosen is high, but in most cases it's not going to work very well. So what would be the best strategy? Well, you probably already know the answer. Start by guessing 25, and then if you say more or less, I choose a, a value that's in the middle of the new interval, and so on. Okay, time to stop playing games and see what Bolzano's theorem is all about. Bolzano's theorem states that if we have a continuous function f defined on a closed interval, a, b, in r, such that f at a times f at b is less than zero, then there is a c in the open interval a, b, such that f at c equals zero. What does it mean if f at a times f at b is less than zero? Remember that when multiplying signs, plus times minus or minus times plus is negative. So, if when we multiply f at a times f at b, the result is negative, f at a and f at b must have different signs. Bolzano's theorem states that if we have a continuous function f defined on a closed interval, and the signs of the images at the ends of the interval are different, then at some point within the interval, the function must take the value zero. In other words, the graph of the function must cross the x-axis. It's easy to understand. There are two possibilities. Either f at a is less than zero and f at b is greater than zero, or f at a is greater than zero and f at b is less than zero. In the first case, the function starts off negative and has to become positive, and because it's continuous, there can't be any sudden jumps. So, there has to be a point c where the value of the function is zero. In the second case, where f at a is greater than zero and f at b is less than zero, the function has to go from positive to negative. And again, because of continuity, there has to be a c within the interval where the function is zero. It's a very intuitive result, but how can we prove it? Well, there are various methods. One of them uses another famous result in mathematics called Cantor's Theorem of Nested Intervals. Let's consider the situation where f at a is less than zero and f at b is greater than zero. We can deal with the other case by analogy. We only consider the domain and the signs of the function at the ends of the interval. The image at a is negative and the image at b is positive. The interval has length b minus a. Let's call the ends of the interval a1 and b1. Initially, we have a first closed interval i1 equal to a1 b1 of length b minus a. The midpoint of the interval is a1 plus b1 over 2, although for our argument we don't need to remember this. Think about the image at the midpoint. If it's zero, then we already have a value inside the interval where the image is zero. We know the value of c there and we're done. Otherwise, the image of the midpoint could be positive or negative. If it's positive, in which of the two intervals does the image change sign at the ends? Well, it has to be the one on the left side. Then we'll call the end point on the left a2 and the midpoint b2 giving us a new interval i2 equal to a2 b2. At the left end, the image is negative. At the right end, the image is positive. 
and the length of this interval is clearly half of the previous one, b minus a over 2. In the other case, if the image of the midpoint is negative, the sign change has to be in the right-hand interval. Now a2 is the midpoint, b2 is at the right end, and we now have the interval a2, b2, where the image is also negative on the left end, the image is positive on the right end, and the interval length is half of the original b minus a over 2. In either case, we get an interval a2, b2, where the sine of f is different at the ends. At the left end, the image is negative, and at the right end, the image is positive. Suppose the second situation has occurred. If the image at the midpoint is zero, well, we already have c. Otherwise, depending on the sign of the image, we take the interval from the left or from the right. In any event, we now have a new interval, i3 equals a3, b3, where the image on the left end is negative, the image on the right end is positive, and the length of the interval is half of the previous one. Half of b minus a over 2 is b minus a over 2 divided by 2, or b minus a over 2 squared. We can repeat this procedure again and again until we find the desired c value or indefinitely obtaining a succession of closed intervals i1, i2, i3, and so on. The interval in having extremes an and bn. The length of the first interval is b minus a, the second b minus a over 2, the third b minus a over 2 squared, and so on, all the way up to the nth interval, which will measure b minus a over 2 to the n. The important thing is that because we have 2 raised to the n in the denominator, the sequence of lengths tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. When we have a succession of intervals like this, each interval closed and including the next one, the intervals are said to be nested. What happens as the length limit tends to zero? Cantor's nested interval theorem says that the intersection of all these intervals is a point, the set containing the single value c. This c will be the limit of the sequence formed by the left ends of the intervals and also the limit formed by the right ends if these intervals converge on c from both sides. In the first case, we'd have that f at c is f of the limit of the a sub i. But since f is a continuous function, by a property of such functions, this limit can go out and remember that all these images are negative, so the limit, where it exists, of a succession of negative numbers can be at most zero. In other words, less than or equal to zero. In the same way, in the second case, we'd have that f at c is f of the limit of bi, and again, by continuity, the limit goes out and these images are positive. So, we have the limit where it exists, of a succession of positive values is greater than or equal to zero. Now, if f at c is less than or equal to zero and greater than or equal to zero, then necessarily f at c must equal zero. We found the c inside the interval whose image is zero and have proved Bolzano's theorem. What can we say about this theorem? It assures the existence of solutions of equations of the form f of x equals zero, where f is a continuous function, and that there are two values whose images have different signs. Moreover, the proof we've given is constructive. By repeating the method we've described here for each equation, with the conditions corresponding to the hypotheses of Bolzano's theorem, we can obtain approximations of a solution of a given equation. This method is known as the bisection method. There are faster ways to solve equations numerically, such as Newton's method, but the good thing about the bisection method is that it's safe, in the sense that you can always get as close as you want to the solution. That's it for now. Thanks for watching, 
and I hope you'll join me again very soon to discover more maths.